Hey, this is Flywire on the Road, and I'm at Blackbush Airport, and this used to be RAF Hartford? Hartford Bridge. Hartford Bridge in World War II. That's how it got its start on common land, which is not owned by anyone, and still is, sort of. So, anyway, we're going to talk about that, so stick with us on Flywire. Hey, I'm Scott Perdue, and I'm here at Blackbush uh, Airport in uh, the UK. We're just south of London. I'm with Stuart Morris, and he uh, bases his Bonanza here. This is his Bonanza. It's an unregistered airplane, and we're, he's going to tell us about a couple of things. One is his flying here in the UK, learning how to fly, and about Blackbush Airport, really interesting history, and uh, uh, other stuff like that. So, Stuart. Tell us, tell us about yourself. How'd you get into flying? So I've been interested in flying since I was nine years old. Uh, my grandfather flew Lancasters and Wellingtons during the Second World War. And uh, I was nine years old and a Spitfire flew over his house and he pointed up at this airplane. He said to me, that's nothing. I used to fly four of those at the same time. Um, even at nine, I was thinking, okay, you're a hero, Grandpa, but that doesn't work. And then he went on to tell me that a Lancaster bomber has four Merlin engines and the Spitfire only has one, and that's what he meant. And he taught me about navigation with his old World War II charts and the slide rule and you know, the, it, all of the old school techniques. And so I just wanted to be a pilot. I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to, didn't want to fly fast jets, you know, which is your background. I just wanted to fly something. When I was 14, I went to an RAF Open Day, Careers Day, and I said, like, yes, I'm going to become a pilot for the <laughs> RAF and fly Chinooks or something interesting. And um, talking to the guys, you know, and what's your eyesight like? And my mum said, oh, he's red, green, colorblind. No class one medical. That was the end of my flying career. So I went off, you know, broken hearted and got into computing. That was my career. And uh, 2018, finally said you know what I'm gonna get my pilot's license and I came here to Blackbush to a flight school here and started learning to fly passed my check ride on uh, in late October 2020 I passed my check ride uh, was October 2020 so through lockdown and everything else I'd been sitting on the ground practicing on the simulator and I um, Past my check ride and parked right here was a Beechcraft Musketeer, which was my first airplane that I, that I bought. And so the last two years I've been flying that, uh, 170 something hours in that, absolutely loved it. But this, the, the V-Tail Bonanza, has been my dream since I was about 10 and first saw one. And uh, two months ago, 20 flying hours ago, I managed to, to buy this 1961 uh, N35 and absolutely loving it. So. Uh, it's become a bit of a business tool, so I can travel to uh, to my business up in Yorkshire in much less time now, and just the joy of flying. That's, That's a big it. transition, and you started off flying mo micro lights, yeah. right? Yeah, so I've been 20 yeah. years flying ultra micro lights, paramotors. And then you decided in 2018 that I'm going to go ahead and get uh, a powered license, yep. and off you go. So tell me a little bit about how that worked here in the UK to get the powered license uh, with UK powered license and then uh, and to then the enrich, yeah. So essentially, in the UK, um, it's harder. Flying is harder <laughs> here than it is in America. Harder and much more expensive. Much more expensive. If I had a G registered, my, my first airplane, the, the Musketeer, was a G registered airplane, Gulf Alpha Whiskey Fox Shot Zulu, uh, which I call Foxy, because airplanes have names, right? Airplanes should have names. Every, yeah. And um, so the, there's no problem there. With an N-registered airplane, in the UK, the regulations are I can only fly it on my UK license. But as soon as I cross an FIA boundary, so if I go to France, I need an FAA license. So um, it's kind of weird. The, the only place in the world I can't fly this airplane on a FAA license is my home country. <laughs> Welcome to Britain. Um, and uh, so that's a... Uh, that's, just, that's just not fair. I just want to say that. It's just not fair because... I, I can I can fly this here because it's an unregistered airplane. But if it was a G registered airplane, I couldn't fly. You it. can't fly here. No. What? <laughs> <laughs> just just madness. Of, uh, and it's it's rules that probably were rooted in some sensible thing at one point. One point, yeah. Um, and like you know, in the U.S., we've just got the STCs come through for a um, hundred unleaded. 
And now the Civil Aviation Authority and EASA in Europe are going to go through a completely new process to get this fuel uh, approved here. Or maybe they won't ever bother. I, I hope they will. Um, Hang on, the FAA have spent years doing all this testing. Well, it's actually George Brawley and Tim Royal at the GAMI Gam that did all of that testing. They found 13 years. Fought, fought, and fought, and fought, and yeah. fought. And then finally yeah. it's all come through. And I'm sort of thinking, the CAA really going to make them go through a whole load more hoops? You know, what testing are you going to do that hasn't already been done? But hey, administrators have to justify their existence, existence somehow. Yes. So hey. So Hartford Bridge, uh, as a was requisitioned, the land was requisitioned in 1941, and by the RAF during uh, the war. And then over the years, it it developed. Um, so there's been Harvards here, Mosquitoes, uh, the occasional heavy bomber, the Lancasters, the Wellingtons, Spitfires, Hurricanes. Um, and then it became one of the first bases for the Pathfinder squadrons, who, who flew across to Germany. Uh, dropped phosphorus flares, which meant that the heavy bombers could fly over at night in poor visibility and still have something to, to aim at. That was the whole point of the Pathfinder. Yeah, and real quick, they dropped phosphorus because you can't really put it out. Yeah, it doesn't. So the Germans try to put it out, and it just makes it bigger. Yeah, because phosphorus loves water. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and my grandfather told me you know, he'd be flying really high in a, in a Lancaster or a Wellington, and they'd be looking for these really bright fires on the ground, and that was the, the bomb aiming target that the, the Pathfinder guys had done. So it was a huge um, step forward in precision bombing at the time um, because they didn't have any guided weapons at that point. Uh, and so, yeah, Blackbush has this really strong history. And then after the war, it became uh, a civil air airport. You know, uh, there were airlines based here, 200,000 passengers a year at, at its peak. And then by the 60s, it was just a desolate wasteland. Nothing happened at all. Um, people used it for car boot sales, you know, just jumble sale type thing. Bob Dylan played a, a concert <laughs> here once. Um, and then more recently, uh, a group of guys got together and they, they leased the site or bought the site. It's, it's complex because of this common land thing. Uh, so essentially there's a, a public footpath right across the middle of the site. So every year, um, somebody walks that just to maintain, maintain the, 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 the It's funny you mention that because RAF Lake and Heath, where I flew Strike Eagles, uh, had exactly that. Yeah. And they made a particular time and they opened it up. And people would, I mean, you get probably 100 or more people would walk across that path and then they'd shut it down. Exactly <laughs> the same happens here. The fire crew <laughs> escort them yeah. and, and away you go. And then so in more recent years, you know, it's become a, this bustling GA airport. Uh, and GA in the UK is very, very different from in the US. So there are very few, if, in fact, almost no publicly owned airports, whereas you guys are used to essentially everything's public. And we've just been up in the tower here, and the, the guys are employees of the airport company, not of the, the CAA FAA. Or yeah. the FAA. Um, and so it's very much down to the, the business managers to keep the airport going and we've seen lots of airports in the UK sold off and turned into housing estates you know, we're, we're losing GA infrastructure at, at a really scary rate and so it's actually becoming harder to find useful places to fly to um, and that's because in, in a sense the UK and if you think of the UK it's it's smaller than most US states um, the need for aviation as a method of transport just hasn't been there whereas in the US you, know, you needed airplanes to to get, get around, places. yeah. 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 So it, it's a factor of the scale of the country. Aviation, we have a strong history of aviation in the UK and aviation innovation, but for either military or civil airliner purposes, not so much for GA. Which is unfortunate. It's yeah. a huge shame. Well, so tell me about the... Uh, um, what is it like to fly here? So you want to go for the what we call the hundred dollar hamburger, which is really more like a three hundred dollar hamburger nowadays. But uh, so how does it work? You want to go out to lunch at, at an airport? How does it uh, how does it work? You probably have to file a PPR public a prior permission required. Right. Um, so you go on their website and you fill a form in. You send that off and you have to wait for the email to come back. Um, then I have to call up the tower or email the tower here to book out. Um, and I, I was flew down to uh, Bournemouth yesterday and we were returning and I'd forgotten to book out so you called up the tower uh, you're not booked out 
okay, so I have to now shut down, make a phone call, book out, and then call up the tower again. And, oh yeah, I've got your details now. <laughs> just, <laughs> right. we're, we're pain. So uh, then flying, there's this big argument in the UK, uh, not argument, discussion, you know, through controlled airspace or around controlled airspace. And we've got much, much more Class A. Oh, it's everywhere here. Yeah, it's it's just, everywhere, literally. Well, above us here, it's 3,000, uh, 3,500 feet, and you're in Class A. Um, yeah, we've got Heathrow, it's, it's just over there. Um, and so six miles north of here, it's Class A to the ground. Um, yeah. So yeah. Speaking of that, as long as we're on there, I'm going to make a slight diversion. So they use uh, three different altimeters here. They use QFE, so if you're landing here, you're using QFE. Yep. Um, and then there's Q and H, which is what we use basically in the U.S. until you get to 18,000 feet or above uh, 18,000 feet. And then it's standard 2992. And here the transition out, that's called the transition altitude 180. Transition altitude varies. Yeah, it varies here. Generally, it's around four-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Four, five thousand yeah. feet. So then you're at 2992. So that's not, so if you're at 5,000 feet, you're actually flight level five zero. Five zero. Or... But don't forget, we're doing it in metric, so we're in hectopascals. So 2992 is 1,013. yeah. So, yeah. And I've got three altimeters in this, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a nightmare. Um, 2992 or 1,013, I mean, it's just what you're used to. It's, right. It doesn't... Uh, it makes no difference. The altimeter's still reading in feet. Um, so, yeah, I measure fuel burn in this in liters... Um, buy it in liters, but the POH is in US gallons. Um, but because this airplane's based in the UK, on the side here, this is not 33.3 gal- uh, US, US gallons, gallons this it's is imperial. imperial gallons. So yeah, things like that can just, just yeah. become a nightmare. So you know, in general, when I'm flying you know, my, off, my, my usual route here to Leeds Bradford, and I fly through a lot of Class C, uh, airspace, a couple of other airports, but by the time I get to Leeds Bradford, the Class A around Leeds, Leeds Bradford is all sorts of different heights depending on which angle you're uh, heading you're coming in on. And there are times when you end up think you, the controller gives you a clearance. And I'm thinking I've got to drop 500 feet to get under that piece of Class A because I don't have the instrument rating that would allow me to fly through that. So I've got an IMC rating or a restrictive instrument rating which is only valid here in the UK so I can fly in the UK on that even in an unregistered airplane but that rating isn't valid anywhere else <laughs> and it doesn't allow me to go through class A so yeah airspace here it's evolved over time and they never simplify it it always gets more complicated right, yeah and part of the ATZ here at Blackbush is actually in Farnborough's controlled airspace which is a few miles that way and um, if you're coming in out of hours, you're actually going to contact the Farnborough controllers to get them to activate the local flying area, as it's called, which is the bit of the ATZ. Otherwise, you infringe their airspace as you're coming in to land here. Basically, if you can fly here, you can fly anywhere. Yeah, if you can figure out the airspace here, you're good. Yep. <laughs> it's just a nightmare. But, hey, it's still flying. It's yeah. still enjoyable. Hey, do you use ForeFlight? I use uh, Sky Demon is what yeah. we use in uh, a lot of people use in, in Europe. I haven't used Four Flight. I've got Four Flight, and it does have. Uh, uh, um, I looked at it here, and it's got all that airspace yeah. and stuff like that. But it doesn't have the charts. I guess you have to pay extra for that. that. But yeah. yeah, it's. I, I have done it just with a map and a compass and a, a stopwatch, but you're too close. I mean, if I'm flying north from here, a lot of the time you're two miles outside Heathrow's. TMA, uh, just no, too risky. I'm going to fly that with with some kind of digital aid um, and, and a good GPS because I do not want to be getting the phone call. No, not a good, not a, on a good bad scale. That's bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just not good. Just not good. <laughs> so yeah, um, and and the future for Blackbush, uh, they're trying to to get it so that they can actually buy the land and then develop. You know, better hangars, uh, engineering company. So we don't have engineering on site other than um, a couple of sort of self-employed mechanics um, who are always way too busy. Uh, so in fact, this afternoon I've got to fly Caroline up to uh, a place called Turwiston, uh, where uh, they're going to fix my compass. Um, so yeah, it's it's a shame. Blackbush really needs a, a on-site. Yeah, maintenance shop. operation. Yeah, but so 
You do, speaking about names for airplanes, you're going to change the end number on this. Yeah. You're going to so, get the paint refreshed, and then you're going to change the end number too. So the the end number that's currently on it is uh, the initials of the previous owner, and he would like it back. So that's fine. I'm not a problem with that. And uh, it's a 1961 N35, and I've just been offered the call sign N35 UK. No brainer. No brainer. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. So now, is it going to stay the same, Caroline, with a K? No. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, I mean, SC obviously is the uh, yeah. abbreviation for South Carolina, and and uh, for family reasons, Caroline seemed like a sensible name for the airplane. So, Caroline will stay. Uh, you know, I may may paint the name on here as well. Um, airplanes have to be named. They have. They should be named. They should be, they named. Should be named. Yeah. But actually, uh, weirdly, people have said to me, "Are you going to re-register it on the UK register?" And maintenance on the N register is so much easier than it is on the G register. So no, I'm sticking with it on the on the N reg. I'm going to get my FAA license, and then um, brilliant. That's that's great. That yeah, that's good. Yeah, that'd be it's a whole lot cheaper. I was just going as far as having your own license. I have, have an MPIA. I couldn't do the flying I do without being able to do the maintenance myself because I. I I don't have that kind of money. No, I spent uh, Wednesday afternoon uh, refitting the, the cow bolts on this, and they just get signed off by uh, the NP. Um, put it in the logbook because uh, it's a minor alteration. But the two hours I spent doing it uh, would otherwise, on the G register, it had to have been done by a uh, mechanic. Yeah, it would take months to. Yeah, yeah, months to book it in, yeah. get it done. And uh, actually, I'm really pleased with the results. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it looks good. The Skylarks. Yeah. With the slotted, yeah, much much better than the uh, the old Zeus. Uh, I actually had one pop out. Um, so somebody's back garden, uh, there is a little Zeus fastener. If you find it, let me have it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's stainless, so it won't rust. Yeah. <laughs> they'll find it in uh, well, a thousand, a thousand years. years. All those archaeology guys here, they'll dig it up and go, they'll "What the heck is this?" What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I hope you liked the interview with Stuart. Uh, we learned an awful lot about flying here in the UK and, uh, and particularly at Blackbush Airport. What is missing from that conversation is is the end of the conversation. We actually started talking about Blackbush and its history when it was uh, the REF field, and it was an outlier for uh, originally for Farnborough. We were talking about the FIDO system, and that's where they uh, set uh, trenches. They poured <laughs> like 100,000 gallons of uh, avgas in the trenches on either side of the runway and lit them up so they could uh, uh, clear the fog and provide a beacon for airplanes to land when the weather's bad and they're coming back from a bombing run uh, in over the continent. Um, so it was a really good story. There's a lot of stuff there. Uh, the battery in my mic failed, so I didn't get that port portion of the conversation or the close. So this is the close. And stand by for a little bit more on that story about the FIDO system and some other cool stuff that people invented uh, for the, during, during the war. Uh, technology advances in wartime. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Stuart. You learned a lot about flying in the UK. There's a lot to it, and uh, there's some pretty dedicated people that really love flying, and uh, it's great. Stuart loves the Bonanza. It's a great airplane. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire.